Hey friends, how's it going? My name is Gabby. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be doing my March wrap up. And in the month of March, I read a total of 19 books, which was only one manga and then 18 novels. I did end up hosting my fourth round of Screaming Color over on my Patreon this month. And Screaming Color is a Patreon exclusive 48 hour readathon that I host three times a year. But this round, I actually didn't end up vlogging it because I did get into a little bit of a slump during that time. But I did work on a number of reading vlogs this month, including the one that I just recently posted, which was reading Mother Daughter Murder Night with my mother. That was a super fun time. I'll have it linked down below if you missed it. I also very recently just posted a reading vlog where I read some of my most anticipated books of the year. I did Rachel Controls my TBR vlog this month, which was super fun. It was kind of like choose your own adventure style. I had a great time with that and I would love to do that again in the future. And then I also did the Backless Bonanza episode this month where the spin the wheel chooses which books that I read. And I also had such a great time working on that reading vlog that I would love to do that kind of style of reading vlog again very soon. And then over on Patreon this month, I did have some exclusive videos as well. One of the videos that I worked on this month for Patreon was an extended version of that reading vlog where Rachel controls my TBR. She gave me a bonus prompt that was just for Patreon. So I read an additional book just for that video. And then I also posted this video that's kind of a chatty video talking about how my reading taste and habits have changed in the last nine years because I actually just recently had my nine year booktube anniversary in the month of February, which is so crazy to think about. So I just thought it would be fun, you know, to celebrate my booktube anniversary by doing a video like that talking about how my reading taste has changed a lot over the years and it has changed quite a bit. It was really fun to get to talk about. So if you'd like to see either of those videos, I'll have those linked down below. I also, oh my gosh, on Patreon this month, I hosted an Eras Tour watch party. It was like one of my favorite things that I've ever hosted on Patreon. It was so much fun. But anyways, jumping right into the wrap up, the only manga that I ended up reading this month was actually Killing Stalking Volume 4. <laughs> Thank you so much to Sarah for sending me this one. Killing Stalking is actually a mon- because it's Korean, it's not Japanese. And this is one that I don't even know how to pitch this series to you because this series is so dark. It's so graphic. One of these boys is a stalker and then the other boy is a killer and it's kind of about like their weird toxic relationship with each other. It's just very weird, very dark. I don't really think I would just go around recommending this series to everyone because it is very like intense and disturbing. This volume in particular, I really liked this one because volume three was the one that I last read and I was kind of like feeling like, oh, I don't know how I feel about the series right now. But volume Volume four, oh my god, it brought me right back in. Like volume four was so interesting. There was something happening in the plot in this volume in particular that I was so into. And I just found this one to be extra suspenseful and just like really enjoyable to read. So I ended up giving this one four stars. So the first book that I ended up reading this month was Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything. This one is a young adult, what I thought was like a young adult contemporary story, but it's actually more like young adult contemporary kind of sci-fi, which usually is 100% my vibe. And so that's why I was really excited to read this. This was actually the first book that I read for the reading vlog where Rachel controlled my TBR. I pulled a prompt that inspired me to pick up this one. It's over 400 pages and I don't really think that there's a reason for this book to be that long. I thought this book was really strange because the first half of it literally reads like any typical young adult contemporary and then the second half reads like a sci-fi that kind of comes out of nowhere. We're just following this young girl Sia and her mother has been missing for like three years now and the beginning of this story I was really connecting with it. Like I wasn't reading like a new favorite but it was reading like maybe a three or four star at the beginning. I really liked her, you know, coming of age kind of story. It was very like high school in the desert kind of vibes. It was almost giving me like Aristotle and Dante. But then the tone of this book completely changes in the second half and it completely lost me. And this was two stars for me. I really didn't have a good time with this. And then the next book that I read for that reading vlog is Just As You Are. This one really pitches itself as like a rom-com, but I don't think that this is what that book is. Because in this story, we're following these characters who all work at this queer magazine in New York, which I thought was a really fun set because you know I love books that take place in New York we all know this but I also thought like the queer magazine it was really interesting their magazine is on the verge of getting shut down when it gets bought out by these two wealthy lesbians and so we're following our protagonist Liz who starts to get romantically involved with one of the lesbians who owns this magazine now but this one's definitely a slow burn because they don't really like each other at first but the more that they spend time together the more that they start to grow fond of each other but I also think that this story it's not really about the romance like I don't even know if I I would really put this in the romance genre. It definitely feels like a more like contemporary kind of like coming of age story. I really appreciated though all the different queer representation that exists in this book because I was saying while I was reading this I was like I think this is one of the most queer books that I've ever read in my life and I mean that in a good way. It's like every single character is queer in this book and they all have very you know unique individual identities like some of them that I've never read before in books. So I really liked the characters in this. I really did like the story and I actually liked the romance a lot between these two. Like I thought they had really good chemistry even though I just wanted 
more of the romance. Like I feel like this book is being a little bit mismarketed right now because if you go in expecting a romance, you're probably gonna be let down a little bit, but I ended up giving this one three stars. And then the next book that I read for that vlog was Fantastic Land, which like, oh my gosh, this book just came out of nowhere and it's become a new favorite for me. So this book is a horror novel and it's told in a very like unconventional kind of format because the way that this book is told is that every single chapter is told in like interview format from different characters' perspectives. So like every single chapter in this book is just an interview with a different character about what happened at this place called Fantastic Land. And basically Fantastic Land is this theme park that exists in Florida. It's kind of like down there right by Walt Disney World in this fictional universe. And then there's this hurricane that comes and these people get stranded at Fantastic Land. And this story is really about what happens to these people while they're stranded at Fantastic Land. And all of these interviews are people talking about the events of what happened. So you're not really reading about the events as they're happening. You're reading about the events after they've already happened and people are talking about what happened. But it's literally wild what these people were getting up to. It's literally like Lord of the Flies meets Battle Royale. It's definitely got that vibe where like because the rules of society don't apply to them anymore because they're stranded at this theme park for weeks after this hurricane happened. And so people just start acting out violently, you know, for resources and just because like violence for the sake of violence. It is truly terrifying. It is so horrific. Like some of the imagery and things that happened in this book, like I don't think I'll ever forget. And I also really liked the interview style. At first I wasn't sure if I was feeling it because I was like, oh my God, like am I really going to connect with any of this or the characters? But it was so fascinating to get so many different perspectives on this particular situation. And it was just really scary. Like this is something that's really scary to me because it feels really real to me. And like, there's nothing scarier to me than humans being violent just for the sake of violence. And I think that that's a very real and very scary thing. So I really love this one. I give it four and a half stars. I would highly recommend checking it out. I thought it was great. The audiobook is really good too, by the way, because since there's, you know, so many different characters, it's like a full cast audiobook. And then the next book that I read this month was If I Had Your Face, which I'm so glad that I finally read this because this one has been one that's been on my radar for quite some time. And this one's kind of a contemporary literary fiction novel where we're following these four different women who live in South Korea. And this story is really about, you know, like the toxic beauty standards that exist not just in South Korea, but like all over the world, but especially in South Korea for women. There is this one quote that I feel like perfectly describes how this book feels to me because she says, I would live your life so much better than you if I had your face. And this book really does a deep dive into like the beauty standards that exist in South Korea, like how it's so normalized to get certain like plastic surgeries just to look a certain way. Or like there will be so many discussions in this book about how like anybody who's rich is beautiful because they can afford to make themselves look different with surgery. And it was really interesting. I feel like my thing with this book though is that it started to feel a little bit slow for me and a little repetitive. I just never really felt like I really connected with the characters. And I don't know if that's because there were four different characters that we were following in this book. So it didn't feel like I had enough time with any of them to really connect. But I still enjoyed this one. I enjoyed the message in this book and I had a good time listening to it. I finished this whole thing in like one afternoon because the audiobook was so short. It was only like eight or nine hours. So I ended up giving this one three stars as well. And then next up I ended up reading Everyone is Watching and this one was actually the book that I included in the Patreon extended version of you know like Rachel Controls My TBR. This was the book that I ended up choosing for that final prompt and so in that reading vlog I do jump into some of my spoilery thoughts. So if you'd like to see more of my in-depth thoughts with this one with spoilers included then I'll have that reading vlog linked down below. And this is one that I was really excited for because it's a thriller that involves a game show and the show is called One Lucky Winner. It's where five contestants are going to be competing for $10 million, which is like a significant amount of money, right? I don't know though. I feel like reading this book was such a roller coaster for me because at the beginning of it, like in the first half, I was really tempted to like DNF this or give it one or two stars. Like I was not having a fun time. I didn't connect with any of the characters. I didn't really like any of the characters. And I also just thought the book was so poorly written in my opinion. Like the games were not interesting and like none of it was making any fucking sense. And I was kind of like in my head, I was thinking like, has this author actually ever watched a reality game show before? <laughs> the stakes just really did not feel that high for me and every single action of some of these characters felt so like over the top cheesy movie villain. Like, I don't know, I could not get on board. But then the ending of the book did surprise me a little. Like there were a few plot twists that I thought were kind of interesting. The experience of reading this book was for the most part, not a fun time. There ended up being so many flashback scenes to like these characters in their everyday lives in between the games, which I thought was so boring. Like I did not care about those flashback chapters at all. But then I don't know, as we started to get towards the end, there was something towards the end that I got really invested in. And at the end of it, I really did like, 
like that final chapter or the epilogue or whatever it is, I really liked the end result of like what ended up happening there. And so I don't know, I felt so torn over this book. So I think my rating is around three star, which I know kind of sounds high because of how much I was complaining about it. And then the next books that I read this month were all books that I read for the reading vlog with the backless bonanza where the spin the wheel chooses my TBR. The first book that I ended up finishing for that video is The Dead in the Dark by Courtney Gold. And this one is a young adult horror kind of novel that I've been interested in for such a long time. I mean, clearly it's been on my backlist for a while. <laughs> and in the story, we're following this young girl named Logan. And then she has these two gay dads who have this TV show called Para Specters. That's kind of like this paranormal investigation kind of show. And they're going to the town Snake by Oregon, where they were originally from to investigate some things that have been going on. But right when they come to the town, this one young boy goes missing. And so now the town is starting to like turn against them. Like they think that they're bringing something evil to the town. But then this one's also got a sapphic romance at the center of the story because Logan starts to get, you know, romantically involved with this girl, Ashley, who lives in the town. And it's very forbidden in a way because Ashley is actually the girlfriend of this boy who just went missing. And so there's a little bit of a forbidden feel to their romance, which I was really into and I was really here for. And this is another book that I have such mixed feelings on because there were some things that I loved about this. And then there were some things that I didn't care for. The main thing that I didn't like about this book were there were so many chapters that were these like interlude chapters that were in between the character perspectives that just felt so cheesy because the perspective was like from the darkness in the town or something like that. I just thought it was so cheesy and I didn't really care for those chapters. And then I do feel like the middle of this book just really started to drag, like the pacing, it just got so slow. And then towards the end, it got a little bit repetitive. Like I was just ready for things to wrap up. But I also like, I really liked the characters in this. I loved the small town setting. I thought it was so fun. I really liked the romance between these two girls. Oh my God, it was such a slow burn and like so forbidden. And I was here for it. I also just really liked the relationship that Logan had with her two fathers. Like I just thought they all had very interesting and unique relationships. And some of the ending reveals I thought were so like moving. It almost brought me to tears a few times. So I don't know. I ended up giving this one a three and a half stars. It's not a new favorite, but I'm really glad that I finally read it. And it makes me really curious to check out other books from this author because, you know, usually young adult horror novels can be so hit or miss for me. But for the most part, this was a win. And then the next book that I read for that video is The Other Side of Night. And I had my first five star of the month. And this one is a mystery thriller novel, but it's written in a way that feels so gorgeous and so thought provoking. Honestly, like after I saw that thing that said this is perfect for fans of Matt Haig, I was like, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about this book. It feels as if Matt Haig wrote a thriller. Like that's how I would describe this book. The main storyline that we're following this book is that we're following this female who was a police officer and her name was Harriet. And she's trying to clear her name after she had like a lapse of judgment. She has this conversation with this old man and he drops this book and she goes to pick it up and she notices like on the inside of the flap, it said, help, he's trying to kill me. And so she's trying to figure out like who had this book before him because it's a library book. And so then that note leads her to this man, David, who has recently jumped off a cliff and committed suicide. And then they find out that his wife has recently died of cancer like six months ago. So there's also a really interesting kind of love story or like romance happening between her and this guy, Ben, in this book. But she starts to realize that he might be connected to like whatever's going on with all of this. And so now she doesn't know if she can trust him. It's really hard to talk about this book without giving anything away. So I would highly recommend just jumping in knowing as little as possible if you're interested in reading this. But I would also say this book is only going to work for people who don't mind an absolutely chaotic and insane ending to their thrillers. It really stretches your brain, makes you have to think. It's one of those endings that is just so shocking. The plot twist at the end of this book, it got me, dude. It freaking got me. Not only did I not see it coming, but I was also crying. Like what? <laughs> like I never cry over thrillers. I rarely ever cry over thrillers. And this is one of those books that did that to me. So it was a five star for me. I can see why a lot of people aren't liking it though, because this ending is ridiculous, but it's like my personal favorite kind of ending. You know, like I love book endings like this. I think they're so fun. And then the last book that I read for the backlist Bonanza video that I did was Off the Deep End by Lucinda Berry. This one's another thriller. And I do have some regrets with this one. <laughs> I mean, this one ended up being a two star for me personally. It's not a favorite. I didn't have a good time reading this one. This one is about this woman named Jules who gets into this car wreck when her son Gabe and then his friend Isaac are both sitting in the backseat of the car. And so she's frantically trying to like save her son. She grabs an arm, pulls him up, and then she realizes that she saved Isaac. Like she saved the other kid and then her son Gabe ended up dying in that car wreck. She's so upset with herself because she really wanted to save her son in that situation and she thought she was saving her son. And so she has been very mentally unstable and very violent ever since this situation has happened. Like she is not doing great. And then like 10 months after this car accident has happened, Isaac, the other kid goes missing. And then 
and Isaac's family is starting to think that maybe she could have had something to do with it because she was so mentally unstable after her son died. And that's kind of like the general premise for this one. I don't want to give too much away, but I did talk about spoilers in the reading vlog that I did for The Backwoods Bonanza. I did talk about spoilers for why this book didn't work for me specifically, but this one was just kind of a hot mess. I don't know. It was kind of a hot mess. Some scenes got so repetitive and boring and slow in the middle. And then the ending, I was not a fan. I was really not a fan of the way that this book ended. So it was two stars for me. The next book that I read this month was actually a nonfiction book, you know, because I'm trying to read more nonfiction this year. And this one is called Languishing. It says how to feel alive again in a world that wears us down. And this is one that I was interested in because I actually didn't really know what languishing even meant. But this one intrigued me because it says, if you're muddling through the day in a fog, often forgetting why you walked into a room, if you feel emotionally flattened, lacking the energy to socialize or feel the joy in small things, if you feel an inner void, like something is missing but you aren't sure what, then this book is for you. So it says, languishing is the state of mental weariness that erodes our self-esteem, motivation, and sense of meaning. And so languishing is different from depression. It says, languishers are most likely to feel out of control of their lives, uncertain about what they want from the future and paralyzed when faced with decisions. I have mixed feelings about this book because I do feel like in some ways I did learn quite a bit of things because I really had no idea what languishing even was or what that meant before I read this book. So I do feel like it was educational in a lot of ways. But I also do think that, you know, with a lot of these nonfiction books, like some of the self-help elements just really feel so like, I don't know, like cheesy and kind of like preachy to me. And so some of this really didn't work for me, especially like the points where he was starting to talk about like religion and how like religion can help you find your purpose. Like I didn't really care for those sections either. You know, as someone who does often question like, what is my purpose on this planet? Like it was just, a, it was an interesting read. I'm glad that I read it. It definitely made me think more about things. Like I really liked the section where it was talking about the difference between friends and friendship. I don't know, it was really interesting, really thought-provoking, it really made me think about my own life, so I ended up giving this one three stars. I don't always rate non-fiction books, but this one felt like a three star for me. <laughs> Alright, and then next up I ended up reading She's Not Sorry by Mary Kubica. This is an ARC copy that I have, it goes on sale April 2nd, and this was the first book that I read for the reading vlog that I did this month where I was reading some like highly anticipated books, because this thriller author has been very hit or miss for me in the past, but I was really looking forward to this one. And in this story we're following this character named Megan who works as an ICU nurse Nurse, and she's working there when they bring in this woman named Caitlin who has recently jumped off a bridge attempting to like commit suicide and she comes in with a head injury and she's in a coma now but they start to question like well was she actually trying to jump or did somebody push her like was there something more involved there and then there's this like creepy dude who keeps showing up at the hospital who's just like watching her from afar they don't know who he is and then there's all of these like break-ins happening in the area and you know this character Megan she's a single mother she's taking care of her daughter they look Live alone and so there's all kinds of you know things happening in this thriller but the main mystery is trying to figure out like what happened with this girl Caitlin and like if she was pushed or if she did this intentionally this is another one where I feel a little bit all over the place because there were some things that I really liked about this I mean let's just say there was one plot twist towards the ending that I was like absolutely shocked like it really caught me off guard I don't know why I didn't see it coming but I didn't and so I was really surprised and impressed by that but I also feel like with this thriller it was like one of those thrillers where I was just waiting for it to grip me you know I was just like waiting and waiting and waiting to get pulled into the story and I feel like it never really happened. I never got sucked into the story the way that I typically do with thrillers. And then there was a twist towards the end that I thought was like the most obvious shit. And I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be like the biggest plot twist at the end because it was kind of saved for like one of the final things. And I was kind of like, okay, like that was so obvious. Like I saw that coming from page one. And so this ended up being another three star for me. Oh my God. I swear March was the month of the three star reads, which is like not necessarily a bad thing, but like three stars are just so mid. And next up, I ended up reading Bride by Allie Hazelwood, another three star book. <laughs> so this book is currently a really popular paranormal romance that has been making the rounds right now because you know, Allie Hazelwood is a very popular romance author. She's actually the reason why I wanted to read this book because, you know, even though paranormal romance doesn't always tend to be my thing, I just really like Allie Hazelwood. I've really enjoyed a lot of her romance books, so I wanted to give this one a shot. And in this story, we're following this character named Misery, who is a vampire. She's actually the daughter of this really powerful vampire councilman, and he wants her to marry the Alpha Ware whose name is Lo Moreland, and he wants them to marry because there is currently like a weird political climate between the vampires and 
the wares. And he kind of wants them to be like an example that there can be peace between their communities. And so this one has, you know, the marriage of convenience trope, which is definitely one of my personal faves. And this is another book that I'm so torn about. I ended up giving it three stars because I loved the romance between these two, okay? I was here for the romance. I thought they were actually so cute together. I thought they had so much chemistry. I was like literally kicking my feet and squealing at some scenes. Like they were so cute. But then I also, I ended up giving this one three stars because I was not that invested in like the vampire and werewolf politics that were going on. I just thought the political kind of stuff was kind of boring in this book and I just didn't really care. And then also some of the like werewolf omegaverse stuff was a little bit like not my thing. Like I just don't think that that's my thing in romance books. But I do get the hype with this. Like I understand why people are loving this because I thought that they were so cute together. Like they had great chemistry. So it was about three stars for me. And then I ended up reading A Love Song for Ricky Wilde by Tia Williams. This is another romance that's like one of my most anticipated of the whole year because of how much I loved Seven Days in June. And this one is a romance where we're following this character named Ricky Wilde. She's gonna be opening this flower shop in New York City called Wild Things. And it's so cute. I was obsessed. I was obsessed with her as a character. I just absolutely adored her. I really related to like her talk about her social anxieties. And I loved the New York City vibes in this book. Oh my god. So in this book, Ricky keeps seeing this guy around everywhere she goes and she keeps feeling like she has some kind of unexplained connection with this man. Like she doesn't know who he is but she feels connected to him in some weird way and then in alternate chapters we not only get Ricky's perspective in this book but in alternate chapters we do follow the perspective of this guy named Breeze who was living in New York in the 1920s and so these two timelines are taking place like a hundred years apart from each other and I'm not gonna lie like the main reason why this book ended up being around like a 3.5 for me is because I didn't care about any of the other perspectives that we were getting in this book except for Ricky's I just feel like this book could have really improved for me if we were only following from Ricky's perspective because she was the main character that I was connecting with and I just didn't care for like the multiple perspectives in this book and then there was also like there was a moment halfway in the book where there was something that was revealed to us I think as the reader that I thought was very obvious and I don't know if it was meant to be you know a, a big shocking reveal or if we were supposed to have known but it was written in such a way that felt very dramatic like we were supposed to be shocked by what happened and I just didn't feel very surprised by that it was actually a little bit underwhelming like what ended up happening like I thought it was gonna be a little bit more interesting but then the ending of this book oh my gosh I absolutely loved the ending of this like it literally made me almost emotional I was gonna cry I did actually include some spoilers in the reading vlog that I filmed so if you do want more of my thoughts like where I do jump into spoilers a little bit to explain myself a little bit better then I'll have that reading vlog linked down below then in that reading vlog I also read The Fury by Alex Michaelides which this was my book troop book club pick for the month of March so I will have the book troop live show linked down below if you missed it but this book was quite an interesting time you know this was definitely one of my most anticipated books of this year because of how much I loved the two previous books written by this author and this one unfortunately is probably my least favorite from him so far but I still had a somewhat fun time reading this like I didn't hate this book the way a lot of people seem to be hating it but in this story we're following this character named Elliot and he is like our narrator for the story. He's doing a lot of like breaking the fourth wall, talking directly to you as the reader. It almost reminded me a little bit of that book, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. Like it definitely has that vibe where like Elliot's just talking to you as the reader and like trying to be like a witty, funny guy. But in the story, we're following a whole group of characters who are going to this private island in Greece together. And Elliot is the main narrator, but it's really about this actress named Lana. And then murder happens while they're on the island. And it kind of reads almost like an Agatha Christie, like who done it and I was having the literal time of my life with the first like 100 to 150 pages like I thought this was so much fun at the beginning but then I also feel like oh my gosh like I don't know the narration style it really started to drive me nuts towards the second half of the book. I don't know, the writing style just really got on my nerves in the second half of this book. And it just really started to feel like repetitive and like I, the story was just dragging, I just needed more. But then even the climax in the story, it's like one of those plot twists where you're just like, okay, you really, really need to like suspend your disbelief for this one. And even though I did enjoy, I did enjoy like the last final twist that was revealed, but for the most part, this book was kind of a hot mess. Like it was all over the place. And I just don't know how I feel about any of it, but it feels right that this is probably like a three 
star for me because of course, you know, it's March. It's the month of the three stars. And then the next book that I read this month was Midnight on Beacon Street. I ended up getting this one from my library and this was like a mystery thriller kind of horror book that I was really excited to read because this one takes place in October 1993. It says this is a love letter to vintage horror movies in which a babysitter must overcome her own anxiety to protect two children when strangers come knocking at the door. Just that premise alone, I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, it's like a babysitter and like some strangers come knocking and like shit goes down. And let me tell you, this book is only about 190 pages and nothing fucking happens in this book. Like literally nothing fucking happens. Nothing. I was actually really upset when I read this book because I had such high expectations for it. Like this cover is so freaking cute and that premise was everything. So like I should have been the target audience for this, but I feel like this book is being completely mismarketed. Like completely. Because this doesn't really read like a horror or a thriller at all. If anything, it reads like a little bit of a cozy, like coming of age kind of situation. This book was so confusing too with the way that it was written because it would try to go like back and forth in the timeline constantly. Like we would follow the young boy, Ben, and he's like one of the kids that she's watching. We would follow his perspective and then it would be like six minutes after midnight. And then in the next chapter, it's like six hours before midnight. And then the next chapter, it's like 10 hours before midnight. And then the next chapter is like six years ago. And you're like, what is going on? Like I just found the timeline in general was so confusing and like for what? And those chapters that were taking place like years ago, like I'm sorry, there was no reason for those. Like there was absolutely no reason. And then literally like nothing's even happening in the present day chapters. Like it's just this girl inviting all of these kids from her high school over and they're all just talking about their bullshit high school drama for like the entire 190 pages. I'm not even kidding you when I say that nothing even remotely interesting or like thriller-y even happens until about like 115 or something, like over 100 pages in. But even that, I was like, wait, you're kidding me. Like that's, that's that is the moment we're all talking about. Like that's what we're considering to be a thriller because that was not even that interesting. I was just so frustrated with this. Like it was so poorly written in my opinion. Like none of these characters were interesting. None of them stood out. They were all so one dimensional, so basic, so cliche. This was a one star for me. Can you tell? I really did not like this. Like <laughs> I'm so upset about it. I just think that this is a bunch of bullshit on the back right here. You know, I think this is a bunch of bullshit. It says Midnight on Beacon Street is a gripping thriller full of electrifying twists. I disagree with that very strongly. Like in what what ways this a gripping thriller full of electrifying twists like be so fucking for real right now that is so mismarketed truly unfortunate for this book and then the next couple of books that i read were all books that i read for my screaming color readathon that i hosted over on patreon the main theme you know for this readathon is just to read books that all had like yellow or gold on the cover so for this round i actually ended up reading big swiss was the first book that i read i actually started and finished this like before the readathon even started but i'm still counting this towards my reading for the readathon but this is a book that i was really intrigued by. I had heard a little bit about this book throughout the years, but then it was actually my friend Lexi over from Alexandra Roslin. Like I just recently watched her review on it and she had me so intrigued by what she said about this book that I was like, okay, I need to read this. This one is actually really interesting. I don't even know how to describe this book. It's kind of like a contemporary, almost like literary fiction, weird kind of style of book where we're following this character named Greta and she works as a transcriber for a sex therapist. And so she's transcribing these different sessions that this guy has had with a bunch of his different clients during his sex therapy sessions. And she starts to get obsessed with this woman who she calls Big Swiss because she's Swiss. And so Greta starts to feel like she has some kind of connection to this woman, Big Swiss, as she's like listening to their sex therapy sessions. And then Greta happens to like accidentally bump into Big Swiss when she's at the local dog park. And she starts to like become friends with her and like make a connection with her in real life. This book was just so interesting because obviously like that is so problematic because she is like literally transcribing her therapy sessions, like her sex therapy sessions. And this book was just so weird. It was so bizarre, but I was so into it. Like there's something about the way this book was written. I only listened to this on audio, by the way, and the audiobook was fantastic because it was really cool because they have different voice actors on the audiobook. So you actually feel like you're listening to like the sex therapy sessions too while listening to the audiobook. But this book was just so weird, dude. It was really weird. It was really like sexual. It was almost like over the top sexual, obviously, because you're listening to like a sex therapy therapy session, but it was fascinating. It was like one of those books where I just couldn't look away. I couldn't put it down. I feel like this book was weird to me in the same way that the book of the most precious substance by Sarah Grant. It was weird, kind of like that book. Like, I think if you liked the writing in that book, then I think you could enjoy this one too. I don't know why there was something about the writing style in this book that just really worked for me. I really felt connected to Greta as a character and I was really invested in like what was going on in this book. Like I was 
was so invested. It was weird. It was definitely like one of the weirdest reading experiences I've had in a while, but it was also one of the most engaging. Like I was so engaged the entire audiobook. I also like random side note, but maybe this had something to do with why I loved it so much because it has Rebecca Lohman as one of the narrators on this audiobook. And she's the narrator of the Fangirl audiobook, which is like one of my favorite audiobooks of all time. So like her voice is just insanely comforting to me. So the fact that she narrated most of this audiobook might have something to do with why I liked it so much. But yeah, I ended up giving this one four stars. I might even bump up my rating the more that I think about this book. Like, I don't know. I just, I really had a good time with it. I was very surprised. I didn't, I wasn't sure if this one would be my thing or not, but it was really my thing so much to the point where I'm like seeking out books that are kind of like this because of how much I liked it. <laughs> and then the next book that I ended up reading for the Screaming Color Readathon was Yoke. And this is one that I'm so excited that I finally read because I've been wanting to read this book for such a long time. This one's a young adult contemporary kind of story. I know my friend Katie Coulson is like obsessed with this book and she's a huge part of the reason why I was really wanting to read this. And in this story, we're following these two characters named Jane and June and they're three years apart. And they're three years apart. They've also never really gotten along very well. They actually have like a very kind of toxic, complicated relationship with each other. And they've also moved around quite a bit, you know, growing up. They've moved from Seoul to San Antonio and now they're settling down in New York, which, you know, this book does have the New York vibes as well. I just have to point that out because I love reading books that take place in New York, but everything's going fine and dandy until they find out that June gets cancer and Jane really becomes like the only person who can help her through this. So this book is a tough one. Like, holy shit. I was not expecting this book to be quite as heavy and hard to read as it is because it's not only hard because of the whole cancer thing, you know, like we're following the protagonist and her sister is the one who has cancer. And so not only is this book a tough read, you know, because of the cancer thing, but also like our protagonist, she deals with an eating disorder that is very difficult for her. And there's a lot of like on page scenes that were so, tough for me to read. So just warning, trigger warning, there is major stuff for like cancer and eating disorders and all kinds of things like that in this book. This one almost made me emotional so many times. And you know, I really do love books that are about sister relationships. Like it's one of my favorite things to read in books. And this one definitely had one of the most complicated, but kind of like complex sister relationships that I've read in a long time. Like they were such great characters. Like they were so well fleshed out. I also really liked the romance in this book. Like, holy shit. The romance caught me completely off guard. And I was actually really here for it. Like I just really liked our protagonist, Jane. I thought she was such an interesting protagonist to follow. And I also feel like even though this book is young adult, it does not read like young adult to me. It actually reads like an adult fiction book. I just really enjoyed it. I had a great time. I gave this one four stars. And then I also ended up reading the book Right on Cue by Fallon Ballard. This is one that I was excited about because I really love the book Lease on Love by this author. This is one that I was interested in reading because it's a romance book that takes place on the set of a movie, which I always think is so fun. Like I always love reading about books that take place on the set of a film. And this one was particularly interesting because we're following this character named Emmy and she is not only an actress, but she is the screenwriter. So she is the one who wrote this film. And then she's returning to the screen for the first time in like a really long time to do this project. But then they end up casting this guy, Grayson West, who is like her arch nemesis, biggest enemy in the world as like the love interest in this, because of course they do. And so there's like kind of this forbidden thing happening because she hates him. Like she doesn't really like him. Like there's this thing that happened between them when they were younger. And so it's like her worst nightmare because she's going to have to be acting with him on screen again. And then it's about how they slowly, you know, start to fall for each other. It's a romance. And this one ended up being kind of Ugh, disappointing. And I don't know what it was about this. Okay, for the first first thing, I listened to this on audio. I was not a huge fan of this audiobook. Like I probably honestly should have just stopped listening and just saved it to read later because I just was not a fan of this audiobook, dude. I don't know what it was about this girl's voice. She was just so over the top, squeaky, dramatic, like, oh my God, every little thing was just like, ah! So I wasn't the biggest fan of this audiobook, but I also think it's because I wasn't the biggest fan of these characters, especially the girl protagonist, Emmy. Like, oh my God, she was driving me absolutely insane. Both of these characters were driving me freaking crazy crazy because like what happened in the past, it was definitely fucked up, but then it's like, he doesn't own up to it. Like he fucked up. He doesn't own up to it. He acts like she's like overreacting. And like in a way, yeah, she kind of is overreacting because it was just some comment that he made that, yeah, he was a teenager. But like, oh my gosh, they just both drove me nuts because they both kept like accusing each other of being in the wrong instead of just like trying to like be a rational person and like meet in the middle. And even though I did love reading about like the movie and the film sets, like I thought that was so much fun. I always love reading books that take place like behind the scenes of a movie. Like I just love reading about it. But it was mostly like, these characters were driving me absolutely nuts. And then like the ending of this book, like the third act conflict breakup, whatever was going on. Like, no, dude, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it was just so dramatic and over the top. And like, for what? Like for no reason. It just, 
I don't know, it just really irked me more than I was enjoying it. I gave this one two and a half stars. It was fine, but it was also very mediocre. And then the last thing that I read this month was Mother Daughter Murder Night. I actually ended up buddy reading this with my mom throughout the whole month. I will have that vlog linked down below if you missed it because me and my mom really did a deep dive into all of our thoughts with this book, including spoilers. So if you'd like to see that vlog with my mom, then um, I will have that vlog linked down below because we really get into it. <laughs> so all I'll say here is that um, in this story, we're following this trio of like a grandma and her daughter and then her daughter and they all live in California and there's this place where the youngest daughter Jack she works at this like kayak shack and one day she's like out on the slough and she sees this body floating in the water and she's like what the heck so she calls the police and then the police start to suspect her like they're like why what were you doing like how are you involved with this and so she's getting put on the spotlight and so the grandma is like absolutely not so the grandma kind of becomes like an amateur sleuth trying to figure out like what is going on so that she can clear her granddaughter's name and so this honestly kind of reads a lot more like a cozy mystery than like a mystery thriller which is what I thought that we were signing up for so I don't know if I really would have picked this book up to be honest if I knew that it was gonna read more like cozy mystery but I still had a fun time reading this book with my mom I feel like there was a lot of things about this book that really did work for me like I think the characterization was done really well in this book like these characters felt so real to me like they just jumped right off the page you know but then there were some things I thought were so annoying about this book and it's a lot of the usual things that annoy me about like the cozy mystery genre but at the end of the day I ended up giving this one three stars I thought it was a mostly fun time and I would love to do that again with my mom like if you have any other books that you think it would be fun for me and my mom to do like a buddy read vlog scenario like that again then like let me know your thoughts and let me know if that's something you would like to see from me again but yeah that is a wrap on the month of March holy crap it was a lot of books even though I do think March was one of the best reading months I've had in a while in terms of like how much I was reading because I really did read a lot this month but it was also like one of the most mediocre reading months I've had in such a long time because almost everything was like three stars like everything was so average for me this month. I mean at the very least I did find two new favorites this month like these are both definitely going down as some of my favorite books that I've ever read so I mean at least there's that. But I would love to know if you've read any of these books please do let me know your thoughts on them and let me know how many books did you read in the month of March? What was your favorite book that you read in the month of March? Let me know all of the details down in the comments below. Also if you're interested in going to Italy with me this October we are getting one month closer to this trip. Oh my gosh every single month that we enter a new month I'm like we are one month closer to Italy baby. So if you haven't heard I'm gonna be going to Italy this October with my mom and my sister. It's going to be a huge group trip. We do already have 12 of us going on this trip and it's going to be such an incredible group of people and I've never been to Italy. It's going to be my first time in Italy. I'm really excited for this trip too because Trova Trip is going to provide us with a local guide who's going to speak the language so like there's literally no pressure on us. We just get to like lay back and chill and have an amazing time. We're also going to be taking a boat cruise. Our itinerary is so stacked and I'm so excited for all of the things and just to be able to like hang out with a bunch of cool books people in Italy like that sounds like a dream come true it's gonna be great it's literally gonna be like the time of our lives so I would love for you to join us if you're thinking about joining I will have the link down below that has all of the information and of course you can feel free to reach out to me if you have any specific questions or anything but yeah that is a wrap on the month of March thank you so much for watching as always and I'll see you very soon with another video bye